Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, this is Lily Gorin with the New Books Network, the New Books and Political Science podcast. Today I'm joined by Richard Alba, who's the author of The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority, Minority, and the Expanding American Mainstream. This was published in 2020 by Princeton University Press, and it is a really interesting compilation of different forms of data to think about our understanding of assimilation in the United States, particularly in our contemporary period. Um, But I'm going to ask Richard to tell us a little bit about that, as well as to start off by telling us a little bit about himself and how he came to the great demographic illusion. Hello, Richard. Welcome to the New Books Podcast. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Lily. Um, Well, I mean, I I guess I could say that the entirety of my career has been heading toward this book. And um, I really feel like the book summarizes a lot of ideas um, that I've had and and reflections. And, uh, you know, so I'm very glad that I wrote it. I didn't expect to write it, actually. After I finished my last book, which the colleague Nancy Foner called Strangers No More, I thought I was done with book writing, but this just kind of came out. Um, so, you know, so I, I, I began my scholarly career in the 1970s. And at that moment, the early 1970s in particular, there was a lot of concern about the so-called white ethnics, you know, the descendants of the European immigrants of the very late and 19th and early 20th centuries, who seemed to occupy at the time a kind of in-between political uh, position in American life. So they were seen on the one hand as uh, people who had grown up in um, often immigrant families and and democratic families, um, but who seemed to be an increasingly conservative force in American life. And you may your listeners may remember this was a time of uh, the Vietnam War and uh, civil rights, and um, many of these descendants seemed to be on the conservative side on these important questions. And so there was a lot of thinking at the time um, that they were forming a kind of a new kind of, if you will, ethno-racial block in American society that they were not assimilating. Um, and I began my dissertation research. I was doing a, a, a Columbia University dissertation at that time in sociology. I finished in 1974. And I began that research with the notion that um, there was going to be something distinctive I would find about the individuals with these, um, with like Italian or Polish or Irish Catholic ancestry. Instead, what I found, to my surprise actually, was a great deal of um, of mixing, um, uh, you know, particularly reflected in intermarriage, but also reflected in rising numbers of young people with mixed ethnic ancestry. And um, it didn't seem that this fit at all the notions that people were de- developing kind of in the intellectual culture at the time about um, these individuals as part of an ethnic bulwark increasingly conservative, resisting, you know, this um, uh, black, for example, social mobility. And so so the only way I could understand this was through assimilation, that there was an assimilation process that was going on that involved mostly the third and generations from these groups, but also many of their younger members. It was both a generational process, but also a historical process of increasing opportunity that was unfolding over time in post-World War II America. Um, So, you know, I wrote um, a couple of books about this at the time. One was a book on Italians. I happened to be of Italian descent, and I was very sensitive to some of the issues about Italians. Um, And, you know, I laid out the argument that, in fact, the real pattern among Italians was a pattern of assimilation. I called it the twilight of ethnicity. And I also wrote a book called Ethnic Identity, which was based on a survey that I did. I had moved in in the meantime to the State University of New York at Albany. And Albany is a very, was at the time, a very white ethnic city. 
dominated still by actually by an Irish Catholic political machine. So I did a survey, um, and it's also a heavily white, it was then, a heavily white region. So I did a survey among the residents of that region, um, uh, included not just the city of Albany, but also the suburbs and, and other local cities like Schenectady and Troy, to kind of investigate, well, what are their ethnic experiences and how do they think about their um, ethnicity? What is their identity? And um, like Mary Waters' um, book that came out at exactly the same time called Ethnic Options, what I found was weakening identity and um, a lot of fluidity in the way people thought about themselves. And basically, um, it amounts to what Herbert Gans, the sociologist, at the time called symbolic uh, ethnicity, namely uh, an ethnicity that um, is more a matter of feeling than it is of everyday social um, reality. So I, I moved on and you know I became involved more now with the study of um, racial groups, but also new immigrant groups in the United States. Um, I had a long-term project with a colleague uh, called John Logan, in which we looked at the residential locations of different minority groups um, in the United States. <clears throat> and um, But my thoughts about assimilation really hadn't ended here. And in fact, assimilation was to some extent, to some extent, evident in these residential patterns. Um, you know, at, at, there was in the late part of the 20th century, a kind of, uh, you know, kind of reconsideration of how we could conceptualize the older ethnic experiences in order to understand um, newer immigrant in particular experiences. And so I wrote a paper uh, for a conference on kind of reconsidering assimilation for now for new immigrant groups, not groups of, who were white, but groups of color in particular coming from, you know, Latin America, the Caribbean and Asia. And it had a, I, I had a co-author, Victor Neal, although I wrote most of the paper <clears throat> and um, it had a very positive reception. And um, people said, well, you know, you should write a book. Well, Victor and I then agreed we would write a book. And so really together, um, we wrote a book that appeared um, uh, with Harvard in 2003 called um, Remaking the American Mainstream. And we became the founders of what's called um, a new assimilation theory or neo-assimilation theory. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, I, I continued to think then about how assimilation ideas might or might not be relevant for new immigrant populations in particular. Um, I, I then uh, was asked to give a series of lectures at Harvard, um, the Nathan Huggins lectures, in which I reflected on um, potential demographic drivers of ethno-racial change. And I made the argument that, and this was an argument that actually came out of my thinking about the white ethnics, that um, assimilation is, is most likely in periods when um, structurally um, there's the potential for um, what I call non-zero-sum mobility. That means that um, groups, people coming from uh, disadvantaged minority situations can rise without appearing to pose a threat to the opportunities of the more advantaged population, which would of course be the white population in the uh, now. And um, so I saw in demographic change, the potential for this. And, uh, you know, so I continued <clears throat> to do thinking about that, some research on it um, with a, with a, a talented graduate student, uh, Guillermo Rizar Barbosa, we published a paper showing that in fact, there were changes taking place at the top of the US workforce that were very consistent with this idea of demographic shift, really a decline in the white, the young white population and the retirement 
of older whites, especially baby boomer whites, that this was creating opportunities for others to move up. We found the evidence. So, um, so you know, and so um, at the so, I, I, but then I became engaged in a comparative project with a colleague, Nancy Foner. We wrote a book called "Strangers No More," looking at immigrant situations and uh, native reactions to them in Western Europe and North America. At that time, I began to have glimmerings that there was something off in the census data about um, these new pop, these new groups, and also especially in the idea that we were heading um, inexorably for a majority minority society. Now, let me just tell you and your listeners that I'm a person who thrives on data detail. I love wading into data detail and sort of thinking about how decisions that people make in uh, creating data, like creating categories and data or analyzing data have implications for their findings. And what I realized was that there was something really wrong with the way the Census Bureau was treating people from mixed backgrounds. Um, so, and, and the, basically the census rules for ethno-racial classification were exaggerating the decline of the white population. And this somehow contributed to this uh, idea of an imminent and inexorable majority minority society. So it was really sort of the last five or six years that I began to think about this and to research this and to discover using birth certificates as opposed to census data, how widespread mixing in families had become. Of course, there's also Pew data on intermarriage, which supports the same idea. Um, and in particular, um, I mean, the, the most recent uh, birth certificate data that I've looked at for 2019 shows that 15% um, of babies born in the United States have parents from two different major ethno-racial categories like Hispanic and Asian or white and black, um, actually in particular white and Hispanic. That is to say a non-white Hispanic parent and a Hispanic parent. 11% of babies born today in the United States, one out of every nine has a white parent and a minority parent, that is to say a non-white or Hispanic parent. And so I began to look at the characteristics of these families and the characteristics of adults who report in census data that they come from a mixed background. And what I found really was that these mixed Americans are really a kind of liminal in between. They're not like minorities in terms of their social characteristics. They're not quite like whites either, but they're in the main, they're closer to whites than they are to minorities. And the one big exception here is the young people of black and white parentage who face really severe um, racism of a sort that others who come from mixed backgrounds do, do not face. Um, but in any event, you know, the evidence led me to the view that we ought to think about most mixed young people and probably their families as assimilating into the mainstream society. That doesn't mean that they become white, they may over time, but it doesn't have to mean that. But it means that um, the, uh, the, they, they socially integrate into environments that also contain many white people. They marry whites, by the way, with very high frequency. So, um, and so this, you know, led me to a really different vision of the changes that are taking place in the United States today and the future to which they might lead, very different from the notion of a majority minority society that is split into between whites and everybody else with, you know, minorities gradually ascending into the numerical majority 
um, position. So that's how the book came about. And and you you've answered a couple of the questions that I was going to ask next, like explaining non-zero sum mobility, um, which is a term that you use throughout the book. Um, but I wanted to ask you to sort of place this discussion of data and the information that you sort of have unearthed in the comparison between what the census says and what birth certificates say. Um, and the trajectory of this information within this context of what we understand the assimilation story to be, um, particularly in 20th century America, because you talk about the fact that the, the assimilation story is one that is distorted um, and also that we have competing understandings of these narratives that also sort of feed into some of the racial attitudes. Yes. Okay. Well, I think, you know, and, and since, since critical race theory is on the, you know, very much on the table at the moment, and I don't, I don't, I mean, I accept many of the insights of critical race theory. I want to be clear. I'm not at all rejecting critical race theory. And I think that, um, you know, the paradox of American society is that we are a society where um, some, you know, suffer um, from racism um, and, uh, and others assimilate. And, you know, and so understanding how that can be, how this these two seemingly contradictory sets of processes can can coexist together, I think is an important challenge uh, for social scientists, um, you know, in, in the future. But um, wait, I, how did I get here? <laughs> it was the question again. I'm sorry. You, you were talking a little bit about critical race theory. Yeah, I was. I oh, definitely. Yes, I'm talking. Well, oh, yes. A competing understandings of assimilation. So, so I think that um, we have um, and a very distorted, actually, understanding of assimilation. And in a way, this is related to critical race theory because um, many scholars um, in the late 20th century and certainly in this century have rejected somehow assimilation. And and instead, they're thinking privileges racism as kind of this foundational idea about American society and and how it works. And so I think there are two very serious misunderstandings about assimilation. One is that assimilation extinguishes the ethnic features of minorities. And, you know, that's an old idea that, you know, you become like the, you become part of a homogeneous mainstream group in American society. And the other is that um, assimilation is a, is a whitening process that makes people into um, uh, something like the, the majority population in ethnic and racial terms. And so if it's a whitening process, that would seem to exclude the possibility of many non-whites of assimilating. And I think n neither of these is really true. And we have good evidence about that if we look back um, in, uh, into American history. And to me, the critical period um, is the quarter century following World War II, which was the period of the mass assimilation of the children and grandchildren of the late 19th and early 20th century immigrants from Europe. Now, this was definitely a racially selective assimilation period. Blacks were really not included, um, but a lot of groups that had been despised by um, mainstream white Americans earlier in the century were included, like Irish Catholics, Jews, Italian Catholics, um, etc. So I want to note two things about this critical period of 46 to 70, let's say. One is that um, it involved diversification of the mainstream. And that's true because these groups were religiously marginal to mainstream America prior to 1950. Catholics and Jews were seen as, you know, inferior 
socially inferior to white Protestants um, uh, until that period. But during this quarter century, Judaism and Catholicism came to be seen as mainstream American religions. So this meant, in fact, that the assimilating ethnics did not have to become Protestant as the mainstream had been up until that point. They could remain Catholic, remain Jewish. Perhaps there were some changes in the, their practices and in their beliefs, but still those, those religious identities remained separate. I mean, the other thing that was very distinctive about this period was the rise of hyphenated identity, something that had been disparaged um, prior to 1950, you were supposed to become just an American. However, in fact, many of the ethnics asserted, again, in a heavily symbolic way, but asserted ethnic identities, declaring themselves to be Irish American or Italian American or Jewish American or, or what have you. So, you know, I think if we apply this different understanding of how of what assimilation was like on the ground in reality to today we see that in fact it's quite possible for um, people coming from minority circumstances identifying as say Hispanic or Mexican to in fact join a mainstream and be accepted by others in that mainstream without sort of um, having to surrender all of their ethnic characteristics. And likewise, um, people don't have to be exactly like the people who are already in the mainstream, implying that it's possible to be non-white and yet to be fully accepted um, by many whites um, and to operate in mainstream settings without suffering serious disadvantage um, because of a non-white identity. And, and into that, you also discuss um, in the sort of later sections of the book, the role that sort of economic status or capacity um, has also played with regard to understanding some of these assimilation, the, sort of dynamics. Yes. Can you well, talk think, a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, okay. So let's start with the, um, the social psychological um, theory of, of contact theory. So contact theory asserts that, um, you know, people from different groups who come into close con cooperative and equal contact with one another um are likely to see a decline in their um, prejudices toward each other. They're, they're likely to see each other as individuals rather than simply as um, members of, of groups. So this is, and so the mobility of many young people from minority or part minority backgrounds is creating the conditions in which the contact hypothesis can operate um, and in which, therefore, they are able to interact with others, especially with whites, the dominant group, um, you know, in, in a way that is comfortable for, for both sides. And that mobility is a result of this sort of non-zero-sum processes that I have talked about. So, for example, um, we see that... Um, the percentage of, of, of young people from minority backgrounds, but especially from mixed minority white backgrounds, their education is, um, uh, their, their, their rates of college graduation are surging. Um, and at the same time, the number of whites among college graduates is declining for demographic reasons. So the college graduate pool, which feeds into the higher reaches of our, of our 
occupational system is really changing in its composition. So the American uh, Council on Education published some data about its recent composition. And um, this was in a 2019 report. And it found that um, only 60% of college graduates today are white. So that's a real decline um, in what it has been in the past. And it means that many more people coming from uh, backgrounds that are not exclusively white are now, you know, in the pool of people being considered for high level jobs. And when we look at high level jobs, and we def I define that as um, the top quarter of occupations, we see that over time, the ethnic racial backgrounds of the incumbents of these jobs is changing. So if we compare older workers and younger workers um, who are in the top quarter, um, the older workers are overwhelmingly white. The younger workers are much more mixed. Whites are not nearly as dominant um, as they have been. So, you know, in effect, this is creating then um, social strata, high level social strata in which whites and minorities, and again, I'm, I'm including here people of, of mixed white minority background, are coming into contact with one another. They are equals, they are living in the same neighborhoods, their children may go to the same schools. Um, and this is sort of changing, this, in effect, the social structure. And that's one of the points that you talk about with regard to the changing social structure, which again, sort of relies on this understanding of the non-zero sum mobility. Um, but you also talk about the fact that the, and you touched on this in your introduction to the book itself, is that the census data has told a story that's not completely accurate. <laughs> Uh, to say the least. <laughs> um, and that people have also latched on to that story yeah. um, to either trumpet the, you know, the coming minority majority switch um, or to stir up great concerns about that potential yeah. switch. Um, and, and part of your thesis is that not only is the census data not quite correct, in terms of w what the narrative is that it's it's selling or pushing, um, but also that you know how it gets consumed in, on the ground, as you say, is is also not completely accurate. Given you know sort of what you're talking about with regard to who's graduating from college and where people live and so forth, can you explain not only about the questions in the census data? Yeah. Yeah, but also what the census data has told us. Okay, so let's take that in two stages. One is the problems in the census data, and then the other is um, the role, uh, and not not just in in census terms, but the role of the majority minority story, which is a very important part of this. Okay, so the census, so basically this rise of um, young people from mixed backgrounds, especially from mixed minority white backgrounds, is challenging the census categories or the census data. And that occurs for two reasons. One is that there are problems in the way the census collects data about ethno-racial background. Um, and so just to go into the weeds a bit. So um, still today, um, the census uses two questions, a, a race question and a Hispanic origin question. And um, it doesn't really have a good understanding of how to bring the data from those questions together. And this especially affects people who say they are Hispanic. So if you say you are Hispanic, or your parent says you're Hispanic for you because you're a child, um, it really doesn't matter what is said on the race question. You are Hispanic. And the problem with that is that the biggest group of mixed young people um, is part Hispanic 
and part non-Hispanic, part white. They, there's no way in the framework of these two questions for the census to recognize that people can be part Hispanic. Once you say you're Hispanic, you are Hispanic. There's no question about being part Hispanic or only Hispanic. And, um, and the, other, uh, the other real immense problem in the census data is the treatment of mixture. So um, in 2020, the census innovated in a really important way positively, let me say, you know, this is a positive contribution in allowing individuals to indicate multiple races. So they could say, I'm part white and I'm part black. Um, and this, in a way, has given rise to a kind of recognition of, of mixed origins as a new and independent status. But in any event, how does the census deal then in terms of this broad white versus people of color classification with, with mixed individuals? It calls them non-white. And that's really absurd. I mean, think about the language here. So somebody says on the census, I'm white and I'm something else. They are then non-white. Well, <laughs> I mean... Just the very words suggest that there's a, a problem here. Um, and this is really covered over in the census because instead of telling us in its public presentations of data what how many people are partly white and partly non-white and how many people are mixed in some other way, it throws everyone who's mixed into a category called mixed race. And and those people in the mixed race category are in our more uh, in our sort of um, media language they are viewed as people of color and because the census says they're not white and so when the census projects in the future that whites are going to be a minority of the population which by the way according to the most recent projections will occur in 2045 um, it is counting the individuals of mixed racial background, the vast majority of whom are partly white, as non-white. Um, and um, so, you know, so this has really skewed the presentation of census data and the way in which it's understood. Let me give you a, what I view as a kind of really an epitomizing tension. So the census has said the majority of babies born in the United States today are not white or whites are a minority of the babies born in the United States today. So this is understood as a telling signal of the future and people interpret it as the majority of babies are babies of color. However, you can tell from the birth certificate data that almost 60% of the babies born in the United States today have a white parent, either a white mother or a white father or both. So, you know, this, these two facts don't sit comfortably together. And they reflect, in my opinion, real problems in the way in which the census data and classification has been able to manage the rise of these of these mixed backgrounds. So, so, you know, I think, therefore, that the majority minority idea is highly problematic because it sits on a scientific foundation that is, um, in many ways, eroded or you know or uh, non-functional. Now, it's nevertheless become a very important idea. And um, it has, it's an idea with enormous political resonance. And, you know, I think that the 2016 election, the presidential election, alerted us to the fact that many whites, especially whites who are not college educated, are apprehensive about what they perceive as the future of the United States. They feel, quote, left behind, unquote. And this has partly at least to do 
with the perception of the ethno-racial changes that are taking place and the idea that the society is heading toward a future in which whites will become a numerical um, minority of the population. And we know from the studies of voting in the 2016 election that many whites without a college education supported Trump and that the reason they did so is so-called racial resentment, which is partly involves the this apprehension about a future in which non-whites will supposedly become a majority of the population and presumably therefore have much greater power um, down, down the road. And of course, the majority minority idea has also fed some extreme right thinking in the United States today. So, for example, we there's been there's been discussion about so-called replacement theory, which is this very far-fetched idea um, that some elites are working to replace whites with non-whites um, for their presumably for their own ends. Um, and you know, again, it's impossible to come to this idea without the notion of the majority minority society as the idea that it's demonstrated by the census. Therefore, we know it's going to happen because it has this scientific uh, credibility. Well, we don't, (laughs) is is the short answer. And I mean, and again, we've seen a discussion of replacement theory in the last couple of weeks on some television shows on various news networks. Um, That's right. And and so, you know, like critical race theory, this seems to be something that people are talking about um, without, you know, obviously any kind of nuanced understanding of what the, the census data is and isn't clearly telling us. Um, but- well, I think, uh, let me say one thing, which I think is really important for people to understand that there is because of mixing and the problems that census data have in, in, in dealing with mixing and ref- in accurately registering, reflecting mixing, there's a growing divergence between the categories of census data, white, black, etc., and the on the ground real life mixing and socializing of, of, of people in these categories. So when we talk about the Hispanic category, to take an example, um, so the Hispanic category becomes increasingly heterogeneous within because it now includes a very sizable number of people who have grown up in uh, Anglo Hispanic family backgrounds rather than Hispanic only family backgrounds. And Hispanic white mixing has actually been going on for a long time since, certainly since at least 1980. Um, And today about 20% of babies with a Hispanic parent in the United States have a non-Hispanic white parent. The characteristics, like the where people grow, young people grow up, is very different for um, these children coming from Hispanic white backgrounds than it is for children coming from Hispanic only backgrounds. So that means we are sort of mixing together in these categories, people who are really very different in their social positions in American society, in their experiences with discrimination, for example, And so this is the divergence, I think, that is really important to keep in mind, that the categories of the census no longer capture clear-cut differences in social realities in the way that they did at the end of the 20th century. And those social realities, as you say, the, the, the lived experience of an individual who is has one white parent and one black parent or one white parent and a Hispanic parent um, is not necessarily, again, how they are perceived by the census, but how they 
live their life. I I had this conversation yeah. certainly during the Obama administration when students would say, well, he's a white guy. And I said, well, I think his experience is one where he lives life as a black man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think one would have to say his experience has been a mix. I mean, you know, he he grew up with white grandparents. He spent a lot of time with his grandparents to read his his autobiography. At least that's that's what one would think. And I think, you know, to an extent that's not true for many African Americans who grew up in exclusively African Americans, he knew how to get along with white people. Uh, so that gave him a very different uh, position in life than if he had had an exclusively African American heritage. Yeah, um, but I, I guess it doesn't make him white. I agree that I agree that's true. And and yeah, I mean, and and part of what you're talking about in the book is you know having a a, a mixed parentage also may position you in a neighborhood or in a school where you have a different experience. And as you note, also that oftentimes those so the the children in those mixed households will sort of perceive themselves more as part of the white majority as opposed to a um, a minority that is of color. Correct, and I think you know a lot of the data that we have shows that they um, they affiliate socially with whites very often. So, for example. Um, a very uh, we have data about the uh, friendships of adolescents that come from a well-known, rigorously collected data set called the Ad Health data, and these friendship data show clearly that a- people of Asian white background and people of Hispanic white background very, very frequently choose whites as their best friends. And again, this is sort of the lived experience of people who are uh, who are coming out of a mixed background. Correct. Exactly. Yes. And who experience who have the, uh, you know, the, the the they're in the fascinating sociological position that they grow up with both white and non-white kin. So, you know, their grandparents are mixed, their uncles and aunts are mixed, their cousins are mixed in this way. And they really, therefore, have a kind of social uh, flexibility that people who grew up in, ex- in an exclusively monoracial background do not have. And and so in terms of the overall discussion in your book, it, you are pointing out the sort of misperceptions around this narrative of assimilation and what that really means in terms of the whitening or non-whitening um, understanding, but how how does the sort of reconsideration of not only the errors in the census categorization, but also in the experience of people, how does that sort of look in the future? Ah, uh, well, I think that the kind of... Um, experience and position that we currently see among mixed white minority individuals is going to become more important in the future. That is to say that we're really at the beginning of um, the surge of mixing. So for example, um, we know that mixing has been increasing over time And uh, it certainly has increased since 2000. So a lot of these mixed individuals are children. Um, And as they become adults and as the rate continues to rise, producing larger numbers of children who are mixed, this is going to become a much more prevalent phenomenon um, in American society. And... And again, we sort of find ourselves in this in this sort of public narrative, though, where there continues to be this fear with regard to what that might be. And, yes, of course. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I and, agree. And certainly, you know, as a political scientist, 
you know, this question of like, who has the power? Who is going to be elected to office? Um, we just saw some of this dialogue in a in a kind of weird way in New York in this in the in the mayoral election, right? A yeah, bit. yeah. Um, and and so, can you talk a little bit about how you sort of forecast or or might anticipate these these sort of continued racial tensions? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I don't think the, the racial tensions are going to go away. We, again, we are a society of racism and assimilation, and um, the racism remains important. And you know, critical race theory is very helpful in terms of understanding the mechanisms of racism in the past and today. I think that the only danger, and it's one that unfortunately many critical race theorists fall into, is seeing. American society exclusively in terms of racism, that that's somehow its foundational principle. And, you know, I think that loses sight of the assimilation side of American society, which is also has been historically very important. And obviously, I'm arguing continues to remain very important. Well, I do think that mixing, and in particular, the extent to which it reflects an integration with whites um, is going to change our politics. Um, You know, and let me again use an analogy. So um, in the quarter century following World War II, um, the politics of the white ethnics did change. I mean, a, a common understanding is they became more conservative, which is true as a kind of generalization, but I think a more accurate way of understanding um, their, 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 these changes is political assimilation. They became politically like the whites with whom they associated in whatever part of American society they, they were located. And I see signs of the same um, occurring for uh, Asians and Latinos. And I think, therefore, this notion that there's a kind of inevitable uh, demographic tide in favor of Democrats and more progressive policies is going to turn out to be false. Um, And I think we can already see the signs of that in the 2020 election, where, you know, one of the big surprises was the extent to which Hispanics and Asians voted for Trump. But maybe more importantly, since the Trump vote was very different or distinct from the congressional vote, the extent to which Hispanics and Asians voted for, you know, for the more conservative candidates in congressional elections. And I think this is a kind of a, you know, a, 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 an omen that um, should be taken very seriously because you know, what we're talking about is growing assimilation among these immigrant origin groups. And that assimilation is going to have political ramifications that really need to be better understood if we're going to understand what the p- political future looks like. Um, and and I, and I think absolutely that's one of the questions that I have moving forward, given the outcome in the 2020 election and some of the surprises in in polling in places like Florida and Texas. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, Democrats have always believed that high turnout would favor them. Well, we had very high turnout in 2020. And it's true. I mean, Biden won the election handily. Um, But still, uh, I think that was partly because even um, certainly among independents, but certainly even among the Republicans, there was some anti-Trump feeling that he just had gone too far and um, people preferred an alternative president. But the congressional elections, which have not been gotten enough attention, I think, really showed a very different pattern of a surprisingly weak Democratic votes in the sense that, you know, that that the Democrats lost seats, the margin by which they hold the House has become extremely narrow, uh, suggesting that it's going to be very hard to hold on to the House in 2022. 
Um, and I think this tells us something that the country has not moved so much in a in a liberal direction as a consequence of the growing diversity of voters, because some of those diverse voters are in fact, you know, more conservative than we imagine. Um, one of the uh, founders of critical race theory, very prominent um, intellectual, Ian Haney Lopez, who teaches law at um, the University of California, Berkeley, um, he and a colleague did focus groups with um, Latino voters prior to the election to try to get a sense of, you know, what their thinking was, what they were expecting to do. And to his surprise, as he reported in the New York Times, um, many of them did not think of themselves as people of color. They preferred to think of themselves as Americans um, who were candidates for entry into, into the mainstream. And, you know, I think this is very telling, in my opinion. I, I, I would agree with you. I think that, as, as you note in the book, that this is a complicated story. Um, yes, yeah. and, and I appreciate you trying to unpeel the onion, um, in this book in terms of trying to get at the pieces of the story and what, what the reality is. Um, so dare I ask if you have another book in you, are you working on something? I don't know. Now? Well, I, I, I'm not working on another book at this point. I am working on additional research that kind of expands on the ideas that appear in the great demographic illusion. But I can't rule out writing another book. You know, uh, I ruled out writing another book last time and look what happened. And so maybe there's another book coming. Who knows? Well, if there is another book coming, I hope you'll come on the New Books Network and talk to me about it. Oh, I would love to do that, Lily. And this has been a wonderful interview. So thank you very, very much. It's my pleasure to talk to Richard Alba today about the great demographic illusion, Majority, Minority, and the Expanding American Mainstream, published by Princeton University Press in 2020, available, I am sure, at the Princeton University Press website. Absolutely it is, yes. Thank you so much for joining me today, Richard. Again, thank you very much for hosting me, Lily, and I really enjoyed our conversation. My pleasure.